In this video we are looking at a man who by all accounts in the 17th century led a life of tumultuous ups yet many more downs, a life that spanned 56 years. He was a preacher, a plotter and a perjurer. His conspiracies and ideas left him untainted until realisation kicked in. You won't find a blue plaque for one of Britain's most notorious men. So what did he really do that was so outrageous and deadly? We now look at the life of Titus Oates. Titus Oates was born at Oakham in Rutland. He was educated at Merchant Taylor School and other schools. At Cambridge University he entered Gonville and Caius College in 1667 but transferred to St John's College two years later. He left the same year without a degree. A less than astute student he was regarded by his tutor as a great dunce, although he did have a good memory. At Cambridge he also gained a reputation for homosexuality and for being insincere and hypocritical. By falsely claiming to have a degree he gained a license to preach from the Bishop of London. On the 29th of May 1670 he was ordained as a priest of the Church of England. He was a vicar of the parish of Bobbing in Kent between 1673 and 74 and then curate to his father at All Saints in Hastings. It was during this time Oates accused a schoolmaster in Hastings of sodomy with one of his pupils. He was hoping to get the schoolmaster's post. However, the charge was shown to be false and Oates himself was soon facing charges of perjury, but he escaped jail and fled to London. In 1675 he was appointed as a chaplain of the ship HMS Adventure in the Royal Navy. Oates visited English Tangier with his ship but was accused of buggery which was a capital offence and spared only because of his clerical status. He was finally dismissed from the Navy in 1676. In August 1676 Oates was arrested in London and returned to Hastings to face trial for his outstanding perjury charges, but he escaped a second time and returned to London. With the help of the actor Matthew Medburn he joined the household of the Catholic Henry Howard, the 7th Duke of Norfolk, as an Anglican chaplain to those members of Howard's household who were Protestants. Although Oates was admired for his preaching, he soon lost this position. In 1677 on Ash Wednesday, a Christian holy day for prayer and fasting, Oates was received into the Catholic Church. Oddly, at the same time he had agreed to co-author a series of anti-Catholic pamphlets with Israel Tong, who was a fanatical anti-Jesuit. He would urged Oates to profit by betraying Catholics to the government. Oates and Tong wrote a lengthy manuscript that accused the Catholic Church authorities in England of approving the assassination of Charles II. The Jesuits were supposedly to carry out the task. In August 1678 King Charles was warned of this alleged plot against his life by the chemist Christopher Kirby and later by Tong. But Charles was unimpressed but handed the matter over to one of his ministers, Thomas Osborne the Earl of Danby. Danby was more willing to listen and was introduced to Oates by Tong. The King's Privy Council questioned Oates on the 28th of September. Oates made 43 allegations against various members of Catholic religious orders, including 541 Jesuits and numerous Catholic nobles. He accused Sir George Wakeman, an English doctor who was royal physician to Catherine of Braganza, who was the consort of Charles II, and Edward Coleman, an English Catholic courtier and the secretary to Mary of Medina, the Duchess of York, of planning to assassinate Charles. Although Oates may have selected the names randomly or with the help of the Earl of Danby, Coleman was found to have corresponded with a French Jesuit, a father Ferrier, who was confessor to Louis XIV. This was enough to condemn him. The false plot had claimed its first victim, though it would not be the last. As for Wakeman, he was later acquitted. Despite Oates' unsavoury reputation, his confident performance and superb memory made a surprisingly good impression on the council. When he named at a glance the alleged authors of five letters supposedly written by the leading Jesuits, the council were amazed. The public were taken in and the plot began to grow. Those charged with treason were refused the right to defence counsel under English law at the time, which meant that regardless of evidence, such proceedings were all but a sham. Others whom Oates accused included Dr William Fogarty, Archbishop Peter Talbot of Dublin, Samuel Pepys MP and John Bellasis. With the help of Danby the list grew to 81 accusations. 
Oates was given a squad of soldiers and he began to round up Jesuits, including those who had helped him in the past. On the 6th of September 1678, Oates and Tong had approached an Anglican magistrate, Sir Edmund Berry Godfrey, and had sworn an affidavit before him detailing their accusations. On the 12th of October, Godfrey disappeared. Five days later, his dead body was found in a ditch at Primrose Hill. He had been strangled and run through with his own sword. Oates subsequently exploited this incident to launch a public campaign against the Papists and alleged that the murder of Godfrey had been the work of the Jesuits, yet his murder was never solved. On the 24th of November 1678, Oates claimed the Queen was working with the King's physician to poison the King. Oates enlisted the aid of Captain William Bedlow, who was ready to say anything for money. The King personally interrogated Oates and caught him out in a number of inaccuracies and lies. In particular, Oates unwisely claimed to have had an interview with the Regent of Spain, Don Juan, in Madrid. But the King, who had met Don Juan at Brussels during his continental exile, pointed out that Oates' hopelessly inaccurate description of his appearance made it clear that he had never seen him. The King ordered his arrest. However, a few days later, with the threat of a constitutional crisis, Parliament forced the release of Oates, who soon received a state apartment in Whitehall and an annual allowance of £1,200. Oates by now was heaped with praise, to the point where he even asked the College of Arms to check his lineage and produce a coat of arms for him, and subsequently he received the arms of a family that had died out. But then rumours surfaced that Oates was to be married to a daughter of Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, but again, this came to nothing. After nearly three years and the execution of at least 15 men, opinion began to turn against Oates. The last high-profile victim of the climate of suspicion was Oliver Plunkett, a Roman Catholic Archbishop of Amar, who was hanged, drawn and quartered on the 1st of July 1681. William Scroggs, the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, began to declare more people innocent, as he had done in the Wakeman trial. It was now that a backlash against Oates and his Whig supporters had started to take place. On the 31st of August 1681, Oates was told to leave his apartments in Whitehall, but he remained undeterred and even denounced the King and his Catholic brother, the Duke of York. He was arrested for sedition, sentenced to a fine of £100,000 and imprisoned. When the Duke of York acceded to the throne in 1685 as James II, he had Oates retried, convicted and sentenced for perjury stripped of total dress, imprisoned for life, and to be whipped through the streets of London five days a year for the remainder of his life. Oates was taken from his cell wearing a hat with the text Titus Oates. He'd been convicted upon full evidence of two horrid perjuries and put into the pillory at the gate of Westminster Hall. The people now had heard enough and had enough, and as they passed him, they pelted him with eggs. The presiding judge at his trial was Judge Jeffreys, who stated that Oates was a shame to mankind, ignoring the fact that he himself had helped to condemn innocent people on Oates' perjured evidence, and so severe were the penalties that it has been suggested that the aim was to kill Oates by ill treatment, as Jeffreys and his fellow judges openly regretted that they could not impose a death penalty in a case of perjury. Oates spent the next three years in prison. In 1689, upon the accession of the Protestant William of Orange and Mary, he was pardoned and granted a pension of £260 a year, but his reputation did not recover. The pension was later suspended, but in 1698 was restored and increased to £300 a year. Oates died on the 12th or 13th of July 1705, by then an obscure and largely forgotten figure. Writing in 1740, Roger North quoted current opinion, he was a most consummate cheat, a blasphemer, vicious, perjured, impudent and saucy foul-mouthed wretch. Those were the days when physical ugliness was equated with moral ugliness. He told lies people were prepared to listen to, and his willingness to see others die on his words made him at least guilty of conspiracy to murder. Titus Oates was happy to light the fire and fan the flames, but his lack of honesty, integrity and cowardly actions meant he would not be the one to get his fingers burnt. Whatever drove this sad and lonely man into a life of manipulating others with total immorality, we will probably never know. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. 
If you'd like to watch some more amazing and compelling stories, then join me today and benefit by subscribing and check out both of the videos on the screen right now. And I'll see you next time here on the History Roadshow.